More than 240 years ago, a powerful, clear, and comprehensive case against mercantilism, against protectionism, and cronyism was offered in the book that launched modern economics. That was Adam Smith's 1776 classic, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Being an economist, I regard that as being the most significant event of 1776. There were others. <laughs> Since then, no topic in economics has been researched, studied, and pondered more and more carefully than trade. One result of all this research, study, and pondering is a strong and consistent consensus among economists that free trade is beneficial, especially for the poor. Just the other day, for example, The Economist magazine reported on a recent study by Pablo Fagenbaum of UCLA and Amit Candlewall of Columbia. These economists found, and I'm quoting them now in a recent paper, 2015 paper, in an average country, people on high incomes would lose 28% of their purchasing power if borders were closed to trade. But the poorest 10% of consumers would lose 63% of their spending power because they buy relatively more imported goods, end quote. That's just a sample of the sort of things that economists have discovered over the years about trade. This result is fully in line with what economists have known about trade for centuries. Trade is an unambiguous good, especially for the poor, and hence protectionism is an unambiguous bad, especially for the poor. And yet, here we are in 2016, nearing, nearing the climax of a presidential campaign in which two upstart national politicians, one a Republican, the other a Democrat, each got enormous traction and roaring applause for repeating without hardly any adornment this ver the very same myths that Adam Smith addressed 240 years ago. Of course, the sad reality is that Smith did not slay the myths that he addressed. At least he didn't do so permanently. He might have helped to put some of these myths into a coma for a few decades in a few places, such as mid-19th century Britain and more recently in Hong Kong. But the same myths that motivated Adam Smith to put quill to parchment remain with us today, alive, snarling, and I believe lethal. These myths include, and I'm quoting the myths now, this is not me, exports are good, imports are the cost we pay to enjoy this good. The more we import, the more jobs we lose. The more we export, the more jobs we gain. Economic self-sufficiency is the path to prosperity. Being part of a global economy is a path to peril. Rich countries that trade with poor countries can't compete successfully against low-wage workers unless rich country workers agree to work for lower wages and under worse, worse, under worse work conditions. Trade deficits are symptoms of unfair trade practices by our trading partners and the cause of economic decline at home. None of this is true. It's all false and spectacularly so. But these myths are each widely held and they are passionately held. I therefore conclude that I and other economists have failed. We've rested content to convince ourselves of the virtues of trade, but have done too little, and we've done most of that too poorly, to adequately convey our understanding of trade to the general public and to policymakers. Thus, this new program at Mercatus on the American economy and globalization. Among our chief goals is to help close the now capacious gap between what economists know about trade and what the public thinks it knows, but really doesn't. Part of this task involves doing first-rate scholarly research. Another part involves translating our own research and that of other scholars into policy briefs, op-eds, blog posts, letters to the editor, magazine essays, congressional testimonies, speeches, and interviews, even tweets that promote improved public understanding of trade. I should say I do my part here. It's, I don't know, it's, it's even shorter than a tweet. I have a Virginia vanity tag on my foreign assembled automobile. You get a maximum of seven characters and a space, and mine reads F-R-E space T-R-D-E. Doing my part. I venture to say that this task of translating the economics of trade into a greater public understanding of trade is the more challenging. My evidence that it's challenging is that after 240 years, public understanding remains so poor. But this task beckons us. We don't have any fancies that we'll create a, tri a free trade nation, as the British historian Frank Trentman described Britain in the second half of the 19th century, but we are sufficiently ambitious and confident to believe that we will be a major player in improving both the public's appreciation of and public policies toward free trade and a peaceful, globalized world. I will sit down in a moment. We're experimenting, we at Mercatus are, for the first time with a new system uh, and I was just introduced to it myself. It's called, I believe, Slido or Slido. And I believe you all have access to it. You're encouraged to submit questions. And my colleagues and I will monitor these questions and use them to, 
to uh, uh, use the best ones that, in our view, will promote a good discussion as we uh, move forward over the next uh, couple of hours. Uh, with that, let me introduce uh, my colleague and co-director of PAGE, Dan Griswold. He's an, he's an old friend. Uh, Dan is the author of the great 2009 book, Mad About Trade. I love the title. Uh, Dan was, when I first met him many years ago, he was the director of the Trade and Immigration Studies at the Cato Institute. He then became the uh, president of the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones, and now he's co-director of the Mercatus Center's Program on the American Economy and Growth. Dan. Thank you very much, Don, and thank you all for coming out today. It's great to see, uh, great to see you all here. What a, what a privilege to serve as co-director with Don Boudreau, who I hold in very high esteem. And it's an honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Douglas Irwin. Douglas Irwin is the John Sloan Dickey Third Century Professor in the Social Sciences in the Economics Department of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. I first heard of Dr. Irwin about 20 years ago. I was a lowly uh, graduate student at the London School of Economics, and my advisor said, you've got to read this new book by Douglas Irwin. It was called Against the Tide, An Intellectual History of Free Trade, and I just uh, devoured every, every chapter, and I've been uh, reading Dr. Irwin's stuff and recommending him uh, to everyone I can uh, since then. He is the author also of Free Trade Under Fire, now in its fourth edition, and I believe we are uh, distributing uh, copies of that. We have limited uh, copies today. Also the book Peddling Protectionism, Smoot Hawley, and the Great Depression came out in 2011. And many articles uh, in prestigious publications and academic journals, including uh, just a wonderful article that I cannot recommend more highly in the recent foreign affairs called The Truth About Trade. And I think we have copies of that uh, here. And he's also just sent off to the publisher a manuscript of uh, a book he's been working on a long time, A History of U.S. Trade Policy from Colonial Times uh, and and to the to the present, he may have to add a paragraph or two after this election, depending on how it turns out. Uh, he is also a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, and he has served in the past on the staff of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and also on the uh, Federal Reserve Board uh, system. So, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Douglas Irwin. Thank you very much. I, I'm so happy to be here because, as Dan just said, I sent off my book, which is a history of U.S. trade policy, uh, to the publisher uh, just recently. And 90 percent of that book deals with what Congress has done and how Congress deals with the trade issue um, over the years, over the centuries, actually. And uh, uh, to be here where a lot of this history is being made and you're contributing to making that history uh, is a great pleasure for me. I'm also very grateful to Mercatus for handing out copies of Free Trade Under Fire. Um, I wrote that book for you. I wrote it for uh, people who wanted uh, a non-technical, no diagrams, no equation, uh, exposition of basic trade issues. I wrote it for undergraduates, uh, policy people, you here in Washington. Um, and uh, so I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at it. Um, usually, um, I'm horrible at titles, but free trade under fire works because it holds at all times. There's not a time in which free trade is not under fire. Uh, the attacks change over time. So when I originally wrote it, uh, the big attacks were against the World Trade Organization. You might remember the battle in Seattle in 1999. You're awfully young, so maybe you don't quite remember it. But actually, if you want to get up to date on that, there's a very bad movie you can watch on YouTube called The Battle in Seattle with uh, Charles Theron and uh, Woody Harrelson. It's so bad, no one cares about the intellectual property content anyway, because uh, it's just uh, um, uh, free on YouTube. But you can take a look at that. Um, but which brings me to the, actually the one reason why I'm sad to be here, um, and that's because uh, unlike that attack, which is ag against the WTO and is relatively mild, I think, in t terms of what we're dealing with today, the attacks on today are just incredibly intense. Um, free trade is very much under fire, uh, and it's bipartisan fire. It's not just uh, the Republicans or the Democrats, it's uh, both um, parties have a, a big uh, angst about trade. And um, the attacks, I think, distort the role of trade in the uh, economy and distort the possibility of trade policy remedying some of the economic problems and challenges uh, we face. The distortion is this, basically, that we hear a lot uh, about lost jobs because of imports, bad trade agreements, or something like that. 
But that's all we hear. We don't hear about jobs created by exports, opportunities for American businesses. We don't hear about the benefits to American consumers from being able to partake of the world marketplace. And unfortunately, this distorts our politics. So you probably haven't heard of a representative, John Ray, who served in the 15th district from New York uh, in the 1950s. Uh, he was a Republican, and uh, he sort of led to something that's known as the birdcage phenomenon. He represented Staten Island and the New York dock area when there was a major port and a lot of commerce going through New York at this time. Um, and he voted against trade agreements in the 1950s. And he did so because there was one birdcage factory in Brooklyn as being threatened by imports. And that for, firm uh, had 50 employees. All 50 employees wrote to him telling him that, that their jobs were under threat because of imports. Now, he was representing a district where there are thousands of longshoremen whose jobs depended on exports and imports. But he said, I never heard from any of them. But I did hear from every 50 one of those birdcage manufacturer workers, and therefore I had to do what I did. And it's, uh, I think we need, if we want a trade policy that sort of represents all of America, we have to think about the broader considerations as well. Now, in the time allotted, I can't do, uh, I can't but scratch the surface of many of the trade issues uh, that uh, are on your mind, but I just want to raise three. One is trade and jobs, because that tends to be the most important uh, uh, argument that's uh, brought up about trade. I want to talk about the trade deficit briefly and try to understand what it is. And then I want to talk about whether protectionism is really a solution to any of these problems. So first of all, trade and jobs. Now, it is certainly true that imports can destroy jobs in import competing industries, and that domestic firms that are producing head-to-head -head against uh, foreign firms, uh, they may have to uh, uh, lay off some workers. So the apparel industry in the United States, the furniture industry in the United States, these industries have suffered as a result of foreign competition. Now, that, of course, that's not the same thing as saying consumers suffer, there are offsetting benefits that I'll mention in a moment. But I think we have to acknowledge that. But let's ask the question, is the job loss large or small? Let's try to put it into proportion. And even more importantly, uh, might it not be offset by job gains elsewhere in the economy? So in terms of the size of job loss as a result of imports, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, until budget cuts forced them to stop producing these numbers, used to calculate why are people being displaced from their uh, uh, current uh, uh, job. And throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s, only 3% of job dislocation in the United States was involuntary job dislocation was due to import competition. So the numbers were fairly small. Um, when we look more broadly at manufacturing, um, you know, people are always con concerned about uh, the loss of manufacturing jobs. If we look at the share of the workforce in manufacturing, it's gone, undergone a secular linear decline since the 1950s. There's no China shock that you can see. There's no NAFTA effect. It literally is linear. Bob Lawrence at the uh, Peterson Institute has done uh, a lot of work on this. Why is the share of the workforce in manufacturing shrinking so much? So it used to be almost a third after World War II to about 10% today. It's largely due to productivity gains and new technology in manufacturing industries that allow us to make more and more goods with fewer and fewer people. It's not as though manufacturing output has fallen or is lower in the United States. There's huge industry uh, composition of effects, of course. Some industries rise, some industries fall. But overall, manufacturing uh, employment, uh, output is up, but the number of workers needed to produce those goods is down. Technological change is the major driver here. If you look at the, a picture of an automobile factory in the 1980s, and the number of people actually putting things on the chassis versus today when you just have a few engineers overseeing the whole uh, automated system, there's been a revolution in manufacturing that has affected uh, the, the need for workers in manufacturing. This is not a U.S. phenomenon. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Across Europe and Asia, too, the share of the workforce in manufacturing has shrunk. Um, and it's, so it's not an issue of other countries taking our jobs uh, because it's happening around the world. Um, could those job losses be offset by gains elsewhere? Well, once again, if we acknowledge that some jobs are being lost as a result of imports, a lot of imports actually don't compete with domestic producers and have nothing to do with domestic employment. But there are exports that create jobs. The Commerce Department estimates about 11 million uh, jobs are associated with exports. Those tend to be high-wage jobs, unlike the apparel jobs which we've been uh, shedding, which are relatively low-wage jobs. Um, and so exports are a good thing, and we'd want to uh, keep trade uh, open to keep those uh, uh, export jobs uh, uh, there. Imports 
also create jobs. Now, you'll never hear a politician saying this, but imports create jobs because half of all imports are intermediate goods that are components into the production process for domestic manufacturers. And those manufacturers are facing very competitive conditions domestically and abroad, uh, and uh, they need cheapest, the best and the cheapest inputs to make themselves the most efficient competitors to serve their customers uh, on the world market. Um, if we raise the price of those intermediate goods to those firms, we hinder their ability to compete and we might sacrifice jobs um, in downstream industries, as I'll mention, mention a bit later. So uh, we can come back to the issue of jobs, but it's a, it's a key one, but it's important to put things into perspective. Now, what about the trade deficit? Um, I, I find it a little bit curious that there's so much attention to the trade deficit these days because I can understand the 1980s when the trade deficit was growing. It was a concern for many people. But the current account, which is the broadest measure of the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, trade imbalance, uh, that current account deficit has been stable at about 3% of GDP for about six or seven years now. Imports are not surging into the country. The it, trade deficit as a share of the economy is not growing. Um, it's been relatively stable. Now, uh, uh, how do we understand the trade deficit? First of all, it's important to know that it's not being caused by foreign unfair trade practices. That's not the driver. It's caused by the flow of capital between countries. And so let me illustrate. So I, Alexander Hamilton will help me illustrate this. So I brought my Alexander Hamilton here. So let's say I'm an American consumer. I have this $10 and I want to buy a foreign good, an imported good. So this, I, I get the good, they get the dollar. We now have $10 trade deficit. Now, what is the foreign firm going to do with this $10? Well, they can't use it to pay their workers in Germany or Japan or China. They can't use it to pay off their bank loans in Germany, Japan, or China or wherever. So they have to do something else with this. Now, if they buy a U.S. good, we have balanced trade, $10 import, $10 export. It turns out that uh, on net foreigners, you want to use uh, uh, $7 of this or $8 of this to buy U.S. goods. That will be U.S. exports, and one or two dollars to buy U.S. assets. That's a capital inflow from the standpoint of the United States. It's, being part, it's either greenfield investment in the United States in terms of foreign investment. It's, it's uh, buying treasury bonds or bills, keeping U.S. interest rates lower than they otherwise would be. It's other stock market investment or what have you. But the point is, is that that trade deficit doesn't tr automatically translate to job losses be because either f through foreign investment or keeping U.S. interest rates lower than they otherwise would be is creating jobs in interest-sensitive sectors of the economy. We can't identify the particular jobs that will be created, but it will have that uh, effect. Um, the other point about the trade deficit, it's, it's easily manipulated and exaggerated. So how many people own an iPhone here? Raise your hand. Okay, just almost everyone. Now, what does it say in the back? Where is it made? It'll say assembled in China, designed in California. It doesn't say where it's made, but every, the unit cost of an iPhone is $150. Now you paid a lot more because there's a big markup for Apple, but the unit cost when it comes off the docks or it's flown in on 747s uh, from uh, China is $150. So every one of those that comes in, it's a $150 import from China. What's the Chinese content of that iPhone? Of that $150, how much stays in China? How much is value added in China? three dollars. It's assembled in China. Chinese workers are putting it together, but the components are coming from Germany, Japan, Korea, the United States. It's really made everywhere, but we're attributing hundred and fifty dollars of a trade deficit to China. The good came to, uh, to us from China as its last destination, but it's not really a Chinese product. So the bilateral trade deficit is very misleading about where products are coming from, and even uh, just about anything. So I run a bilateral trade deficit with my grocery store. I, I spend a lot of money there. They don't buy a single thing from me. It doesn't matter as long as the overall books balance, and that's what the current account is. And finally, the last thing, uh, we have to be careful what we wish for. So everyone says maybe it would be great if we had a trade surplus. We'd be creating jobs. Well, we've run trade surpluses in the past. Uh, we had them in the 1960s and early 1970s. Guess what? Massive complaints here in Washington about that trade surplus. Why? What does it mean? Well, if we have a trade surplus, trade deficit because we have a capital inflow, if we have a trade surplus, that means we have a capital outflow. The complaint in the 1960s was, what is it with these unpatriotic companies that don't want to make investments here that are making foreign investments? We have to stop that foreign investment. So the trade surplus was considered a problem. Um, so just because things flip doesn't mean things will uh, be better on that score. 
Well, that brings me to my last point. Um, what about protectionism as a possible solution, either to the trade deficit or jobs or what have you? And here, I guess I have a very simple message, and that protectionism will not bring the jobs back that have been lost and will be harmful to the overall economic performance of the U.S. economy. Um, so a couple of simple points here. First of all, as I've already mentioned, we lost a lot of jobs in certain manufacturing industries as a result of technological change, automation, and increased productivity. We also lose jobs because of domestic competition. So you hear a lot about lost jobs in the coal industry. Is that because of foreign competition or because of fracking in North Dakota? The price of natural gas is incredibly low, so consumers are substituting away from coal towards natural gas. We've lost jobs in West Virginia. We gain jobs in North Dakota. That's domestic competition. Same thing applies in the steel industry. We've lost a lot of jobs in the integrated steel uh, plants in the United States. Why? The mini mills have grown up over the past 20 or 30 years. The mini mills are much smaller, more nimble, more productive producers of steel. Um, so we're losing jobs in, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, gaining jobs in Alabama and elsewhere where the mini mills are located. You can't, that's technological change, that's domestic competition, you can't stop that at the border. Number two, if we adopt higher tariffs or higher trade barriers, we're more likely to divert trade to other trading partners. So the example here I would give is the Obama administration's decision in 2009 to impose tariffs on imported tires against China. If we raise tariffs just against China, we're not going to create jobs here. We're going to divert those imports to other countries in Southeast Asia. So in the tire example, yes, our imports of uh, tires from China went way down, but our imports went up one for one with, um, uh, from Thailand and Indonesia. Um, and so overall imports weren't changed. Even if we gain jobs in some import competing sectors as a result of trade barriers, we're going to lose them among the downstream users that need those as essential inputs. So for example, sugar. If we impose, we have high quotas, uh, very tight quotas on imported sugar, uh, we may have a few more jobs in the sugar uh, uh, cane industry and the sugar beet industry than otherwise, but we've lost num numerous uh, jobs in the sugar uh, industries that use sugar as an input. The candy industry has basically, you know, we used to produce lifesavers in Michigan and Illinois. We're pushing that overseas because of the high cost of sugar. Same with Caterpillar and Boeing and uh, car producers. If we raise the price of, of steel, we're going to hurt their competitive position and they're going to think about moving elsewhere. Another reason why protections won't help us in terms of jobs is retaliation. So if we go around starting imposing higher trade barriers, we can't expect other countries not to respond in kind. That means lower exports for us. That means uh, you know, if we retaliate against China, for example, are they going to start buying Airbus instead of Boeing? Foreign soy Argentine soybeans instead of American soybeans? Um, uh, other uh, Rolls-Royce engines instead of General Electric engines. There's a whole host of uh, export-dependent industries who are going to be sacrificed if we start raising trade barriers because other countries will retaliate. And what about consumers as well? If we raise trade barriers and raise the cost of imported apparel, raise the cost of imported goods, they're going to have less money to spend on other products. And so they're going to, uh, uh, we're going to see job losses in other sectors of the economy. Once again, not easily identifiable, but no less real no less real. So we can get into all these issues uh, in the discussion. Um, I do want to close with uh, what I call as Ronald Reagan's golden rule with regard to trade policy, where he uh, basically said or implied that we should never consider imposing or implementing a, a policy that we wouldn't want to see other countries also impose. So if we start raising trade barriers, we won't be the only ones. And we have to ask the question, Will the whole world economy, will the United States economy be better, better off in a world with higher trade barriers? Uh, and I think the evidence of history, uh, recent uh, uh, experience, um, and uh, even economic theory says it's not going to be a winner uh, for the U.S. or the world overall, and that we'll all end up losers if we go down that road. So I look forward to your questions, and thank you very much for coming. Very, very illuminating. And we look forward to some time uh, for questions, and, and hopefully I'll get to some of the questions from you all as well. Um, I don't know if anybody's mentioned China yet. But let's just say a few words about China. Um, <clears throat> a lot of focus on the bilateral deficit with China, and you've explained some of the things. I guess you did mention with the iPhone example, but uh, currency manipulation, I guess, is what I wanted to ask about. How serious is currency manipulation? Is China guilty of it? And if so, is there anything we can or should do about it? Well, China currently is manipulating their currency. They're propping it up. 
They're spending foreign exchange reserves, trying to prevent it from falling even faster than it otherwise would be. So we have to differentiate the, uh, between different time periods. In the 2000s, um, China was, uh, I don't know, is this echoing too much? Okay. Um, China was accumulating foreign exchange reserves at a very rapid rate. Um, one could argue that the renminbi was undervalued and it was giving their exporters uh, uh, assist in terms of uh, uh, their ability to export more. But that's history now. That stopped and now they're uh, actually trying to prop up their currency because there's capital flight from China. Um, and so they're overpricing their exports in some sense by keeping up the value. So um, it depends on the time period that you want to talk about. Economists disagree about how important the trade impact was at the time. Uh, but in terms of responding now, it's sort of mistimed. Yeah. Uh, there was a movement in Congress to crack down on it, oh, 10 years or more, uh, Senator Schumer and Graham. And I, I found a press release from Lindsey Graham's office in 2004 that said economists estimate the yuan is undervalued by 15 to 40 percent. If you go to the <coughs> website of a certain presidential candidate, uh, under China, it says, economists estimate the yuan is undervalued by 15 to 40 percent. It's like they haven't noticed that the world has changed uh, in the last decade. So, And you know, what, what's again, this that. is uh, more than 10 years out of date now, because in 2005, China allowed their currency to start appreciating. And then when you factor into the higher, the higher rate of inflation in China, the real appreciation of the RMB has been much more substantial. So uh, those estimates are, even the Peterson Institute, which sometimes you know, looks at these things, and the IMF, um, it's nowhere near that uh, anymore. Yes. It might be uh, overvalued. It gets at fair value or overvalued. Uh, Doug, you touched on uh, foreign investment and investment flows. Let's look uh, for a moment at direct investment. It's still controversial when U.S. companies invest abroad, isn't it? Uh, the air conditioner company in uh, Indiana investing in Mexico, partly I understand because of steel prices. We do already have a lot of protection on steel. Uh, what wasn't noted in the press is almost at the same time Subaru, the Japanese car maker, is doubling down on its investment in auto production in Indiana, creating almost exactly the same number of jobs. And I wondered if you could just talk for a moment about the importance of direct investment both into the United States as the flip side, that's where that $2 on the $10 comes back, creating these jobs in the United States. But can you say something uh, positive about the ability and the necessity of U.S. companies investing productive assets abroad. Why, why is that not a bad thing? Uh, well, once again, it's helping U.S. firms. Uh, so there's w different ways you can cut this. Uh, a lot of what they're, they're doing abroad is uh, just service facilities that will support manufactured exports here in the United States. Some of it is um, uh, uh, like Carrier, uh, maybe moving some of the manufacturing capability uh, overseas to serve overseas con con customers as well, not just coming, uh, sending goods back to the U.S. But uh, your point about the Subaru is absolutely right. So we lose jobs because of one activity or one firm, but we're gaining jobs elsewhere, and we don't n notice that. It doesn't get as much attention. Um, you know, getting back to the political problem that sometimes causes uh, another uh, <coughs> Senator Bob Packwood uh, from Oregon. Uh, was a major figure in the passage of the U.S.-Canada Free Trade uh, Agreement in 1988. And he said that um, it was actually a very tough political pull because um, there may be 10 people who benefit, one person who's hurt, but he's going to hear from those who are hurt. He's not going to hear from the beneficiaries. So uh, that creates the political problem. And of course, when you get this churning, um, exporters and others who are benefiting from trade are not going to con uh, contact their members of Congress and say, thank you for allowing this to happen. But anyone who's adversely affected will definitely let their congressional delegation know that there's a, a problem. So I sort of uh, beseech uh, the members of Congress and the, their staff to think a little bit more carefully about it's not just who you hear from that's important, it's other things that are going on in your district. And if you're creating jobs in Indiana or elsewhere because of foreign investment, and a lot of it's occurring in the South too, so we're losing jobs in the north because there's investment and uh, firms moving to the south. Um, you have to think about the broader picture. Uh, Doug, you talked about the displacement of workers and the fact that uh, 95, 97 percent of the people displaced aren't displaced by trade, but by technology, changing consumer tastes. Uh, we have a question through our, our system here. Somebody wants to know, uh, what can we do better 
uh, to help people, to help prepare people for the negative consequences of free trade and helping them after they're affected by it and basically prepare for a transition in their career. So uh, one of the things I show my uh, class is a video of uh, a Bill Moyers program uh, where he goes to a small town in Pennsylvania and talks about what happens when the textile mill closes down there. And uh, he interviews a lot of different workers. And what you see is that um, older workers uh, are gonna face a much more difficult time. They don't have time to retrain. Uh, they're not gonna move from that particular uh, uh, city. Um, and they're gonna face a lot of difficulties. The younger and middle-aged workers can, in fact, go back to school and learn uh, new skills and uh, move to a different sector of the economy. In that video that uh, I, I referred to, a lot of them moving to healthcare. So you used to work in a textile mill and then you start, uh, become, you become a nurse or something like that. Obviously, we want to facilitate that. But it, it raises the broader issue of, of what can the government do um, or what can the private sector do to sort of facilitate this process. And fortunately, I have a whole chapter in Free Trade Under Fire on trade and employment and the evidence both on uh, government trade adjustment assistance and government retraining programs is unfortunately very, very poor. Um, because the way we run trade adjustment assistance today is it's extended unemployment insurance, which is essentially paying people to stay out of the labor force for a longer period of time, which means you're gonna get worse job market matches. That's not very good. Retraining too turns out to produce negative effects, both for the worker and so society, according to some external studies. So I'll ask you to take a look at that. But that's, that's horrible news, because obviously the thing that you could say is, yes, to the extent that there are costs on certain sectors or certain workers or in certain states, uh, if you could facilitate the process of adjustment, you'd help things out. So I think what, uh, if those things don't work, um, and obviously uh, you know, schooling is very important, vocational uh, education is very important, uh, I think those regions of the country that are not doing well either because of technological change or because of trade, have to think about how can they foster reinvestment. And uh, James Fallows of The Atlantic Magazine has done some work in uh, North Carolina looking at uh, public-private sector partnerships in certain uh, cities to actually try to bring jobs back uh, and see what, what uh, their advantage would be in that area. So there's no easy solution. Um, uh, but I think, <coughs> you know, well, anyway, we can get into that. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, an important point you make is that, uh, in a way, trade adjustment assistance, besides the programs not working very well, it's really kind of misleading in that we should just have adjustment assistance somehow. Absolutely. It doesn't even have to be government. It can be more labor, uh, mobility, uh, retraining, uh, being able to take advantage of community college training and things, things like that. To help people make adjustments uh, for the jobs being created today and tomorrow, not holding on to the, the jobs of the past that weren't all that great necessarily anyway. Right. Um, Doug, we have another question from the audience. Uh, China's metal production is massively subsidized, probably mean steel, aluminum, it's been in the news, uh, leading to uh, uh, artificially low prices in world markets. What's the best way to address those subsidies? Well, here's where history sort of repeats itself because we had exactly the same issue in the early 1970s with the European Union when a lot of the steel industries were nationalized, were supported by the state taxpayers, were, uh, there was a lot of excess capacity, and the U.S. working through the OECD and trade uh, negotiations um, managed to scale back those subsidies and um, not eliminate the problem, but uh, mitigate it. Uh, now China's doing so on a much larger scale, and there are sort of two ways you can look at it. Um, one is that this is not free market capitalism, this is state capitalism. And, uh, it's could, and to the extent that you're creating excess capacity, uh, creating a lot of potential problems for trade friction. So I'd expect to see anti-dumping and countervailing petitions uh, soar as a result of this. Um, and uh, you'd want to do something to uh, push China to reform its uh, uh, state-owned enterprise system. Um, the other uh, uh, argument would be, well, trade barriers may not be the, the best way to deal with that because then, once again, you're gonna make the U.S. a high-priced island for these commodities and these goods. And if other firms in other countries have access to cheap inputs, they're gonna have a competitive advantage over American manufacturers. So uh, I'm sure that um, you know, uh, even if uh, we're gonna have a lot of friction with uh, China going forward um, as you know, economic growth slows and uh, we have uh, some of these uh, excess capacity issues. Uh, Don Boudreau mentioned in his introduction that low-income consumers have a lot to gain from trade because the tradable 
commodities like food and clothing and footwear loom much larger in their, in their budgets. You've got a wonderful illustration in your foreign affairs article where you point out with the apparel industry, and this is a good example of the public versus trade too. What, uh, sorry, 100, 100, if I get the numbers right, 135,000 workers in the apparel industry. Mm -hmm. And you point out we have 45 million people living in officially defined poverty, and yet who are buying clothes and, and barely able to make uh, ends meet. Could you talk a little bit about either the regressive nature of existing tariffs or the pro poor uh, implications of uh, free trade and, and the politics of it as well. It seems like we spend a lot of attention on the 135,000 workers, probably unionized, uh, their representatives up here on Capitol Hill. We don't talk about those 45 million families, not to mention the 300 million Americans who buy clothes who seem to be left out of the equation. And here's actually a point to Ed Gresser's piece in uh, Foreign uh, uh, Affairs and um, a, a bunch of other places where he's pointed out the regressive nature of the, of the tariffs that the U.S. still does have. Uh, we're not a free trade country completely. We still have high tariffs on labor-intensive uh, manufactured goods, particularly uh, apparel, footwear, and things of that sort. And um, you're absolutely right that, uh, once again, it's this imbalance in the political debate. Uh, weighing uh, the, the, the welfare of the, of the jobs of the 135 people in the apparel industry versus the benefits to so many people that are at the poverty line trying to stretch every dollar that they have uh, in terms of taxing them. It's a very regressive tax because a greater share of their uh, expenditures are on uh, exactly those labor intensive goods, um, uh, you know, hindering their ability to get ahead and, and get up the next uh, rung of the economic ladder. Um, and uh, so what's, uh, you mentioned Amit Kamdawal uh, of Columbia. So economists, uh, there's two ways to view the impact of trade on a household. One is in terms of their income, the job they have. The other is in terms of what they're spending their money on. And economists have sort of neglected the expenditure side of the story. And uh, yet recent work is finding exactly what you were suggesting, that um, trade barriers uh, hurt the poor more on the expenditure side than uh, higher income households. Uh, and therefore, they'd benefit from uh, having more open markets in terms of some of these other manufactured goods. Yeah, in fact, there's a related question from, from the audience. What can be done to overcome the concentrated benefits, dispersed costs dynamic, which drives support for protectionism? Well, you've kind of hinted at it, but got any political advice for the uh, staffers when they hear from those 50 birdcage employees? It's been, well, as I said, I've written this history that covers over 200 years of trade policy history. It's a perennial problem. It's a perennial issue, and there's no uh, uh, way of truly overcoming it. Um, obviously, I think trade policy works best when the economy is growing and we have other complementary policies that are expanding opportunities for workers so that you don't see that just if you lose your job, there's no hope, there's nothing else. Um, that there are other, are other opportunities. Um, I think education plays a role. I think being aware of uh, the potential gains from foreign investment uh, and exports uh, in your state or district uh, are important. So. Uh, once again, I think if you both look at the gains to consumers, the gains to uh, exporters in your state or district, as well as the, the benefits for consumers and the counterproductive nature of trade barriers, um, that it's, you know, there's sort of like, it, there's a potential short run fix, but actually it's not a short run fix. And that there are knockoff effects on downstream user industries uh, and others in terms of retaliation and what have you that will just not make it uh, a, a wise policy. Doug, uh, la last question, then we'll move on to our panel, uh, TPP. One, one of the things I love about your work is you're a technical economist. You can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with people with their models and their regression analysis, yet you're also a, a historian. You're able to tell a narrative story. You've written a book on Smoot-Hawley and the Great Depression. That had a profound effect on that generation. What, what did we learn from the Smoot-Hawley experience, the 1930s, not just the economics, but the whole geopolitical strain, what lessons did we take uh, after the war and that we, we should be sure not to lose sight of in the current environment? Well, I think it, it would go back to that uh, Ronald Reagan dictum about uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Um, if you look at the congressional debate over Smoot-Hawley, uh, there was no recognition in Congress that other countries might respond in any way. It was considered purely a domestic measure. They were th in fact, they weren't even thinking about exports, let alone consumers. So. Um, you know, if we think about the various groups that are involved in trade, if we think about those who are competing against imports, that's one of just many important constituencies. If you don't think about exports, if you don't think about 
consumers, if you don't think about what the other countries are going to do to you too, once again, you're going to be, policy will be, uh, become potentially very misguided. So right as the U.S. is going into this, uh, the Great Depression, um, Congress passes a unilateral tariff increase. Uh, imports, as I mentioned, were not surging into the country. Um, unemployment was not being caused by too many, too many imports. It was a misdiagnosis of what was going on. They, did, they were warned about foreign retaliation. They did it anyway. And the consequences were just horrific. Um, it was the last tariff act that Congress ever passed. Um, sort of they learned their lesson that Congress doesn't uh, really weigh all interests equally and, and therefore come up with a, a rational trade policy for the United States. They began delegating uh, trade policy powers to the president. Um, and uh, we began to move away from uh, pure protectionism in, in stages. I think uh, first and foremost the lesson of Smooth Hawley is never underestimate foreign retaliation uh, and that other countries can respond in kind. And then if, even if you do create some jobs in import competing industries, you're going to lose as much if not more in downstream industries. Uh, so just one quick example if I could on that. Uh, Cordell Hull, who was Secretary of State at the time, had this example of U.S. egg trade because uh, we imposed a high tariff on imported eggs from Canada. We weren't importing that many eggs but we decided to reduce them a little bit further by raising that tariff. Canada, which had a very low tariff on egg, we were a big net exporter of eggs, uh, they decided to match the U.S. tariff on eggs. So they raised their export tariff on eggs dramatically, and we, our exports plummeted to Canada. So while we squeezed out some imports of eggs, we lost uh, uh, you know, dozens and you know, who knows how many pounds or how you count egg exports. Uh, we lost much more on the export side than we did on the import side. And once again, that just never, that idea never crossed the minds of any member of Congress voting for Smooth Holly. Well, thank you, Doug. We're going to make a way now for our panel discussion. Don Boudreau is going to moderate, and we have a distinguished panel looking at the, the prospects uh, part of our program to look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's, it's uh, not easy to follow a panel that features Dan Griswold and Doug Irwin, but we'll try to do it here. We'll move more from a general discussion or discussion of trade in general to uh, a particular topic, one that's very timely now, as you know, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TP, TPP, which is much in the news, much in the political news, much in the economic news. And we have a, as Dan said, a truly distinguished panel to help us uh, grapple with TPP and some of the issues that it raises. Um, on the far, to, to my far left is Ed Gerwin. He's a senior fellow for trade and global opportunity at the Progressive Policy Institute. Uh, Ed has authored numerous reports on trade policy issues and is a frequent speaker at congressional think tank and business forums. He also is the author of editorials and trade topics for uh, publications such as Bloomberg, Forbes, The Hill, The Huffington Post, Roll Call, and The Wall Street Journal. Next to Ed is Linda Dempsey. Linda is the Vice President of International Economic Affairs at the National Association of Manufacturers. Prior to, prior to that position, Linda worked in both the private sector and on Capitol Hill. Most recently, she served as Vice President of the Emergency Committee for American Trade, where she represented Fortune 500 companies on trade investment and international tax policy. And finally, to my immediate left, Ed Gresser, who's Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Trade Policy and Economics. Uh, the Office of Trade Policy and Economics is responsible for economic research and it oversees uh, the use of uh, 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 trade data. Author of the book Freedom from Want, The Global Economy and American Liberalism, which was published in 2007, Ed received uh, the Washington International Trade Association Lighthouse Award in 2013 in recognition of his contributions over the career to the, this important topic. So let me um, immediately, let me just ask, put a question to the panel, we can take it in order. Um, what briefly is TPP and do you believe that it will make trade freer? Because not everyone believes that it will. You want to start? I'll start. The, so um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a free trade agreement between the United States and 11 other countries. We have free trade agreements with six of those countries and five we don't. Big countries like Vietnam and Malaysia, New Zealand and Japan. It, and I, there's some copies of some uh, information that you have, some slides, um, it cuts tariffs. It will cut all tariffs on manufactured goods. It cuts agricultural tariffs substantially. It eliminates other non-tariff barriers that our manufacturers, our farm and services communities face overseas. 
It sets in place stronger rules on issues like transparency, um, good government practices, investment, non-discrimination, fair treatment, uh, reciprocal government procurement, uh, and it provides binding rules on dispute settlement uh, to make sure that the words on those pieces of paper, and they're long, and most of, but most of those thousands of pages, mind you, are tariff cuts, uh, that those obligations will be upheld. In a world where imports of U.S. manufactured products come into the United States, two-thirds of them already come in duty-free. From the manufacturing perspective, we see huge gains in eliminating up to 100% tariffs that our manufacturers are facing in big and growing markets like Vietnam and, and Malaysia. But the non-tariff barrier side, the basic rules of the road of the system, which by the way, are sort of the basic rules we have here in the United States, like in the investment chapter, which comes exactly from our Constitution and the Administrative Procedure Act so that governments don't misuse their power against the private sector. These are strong rules, and we believe that this is going to grow the ability of manufacturers to engage in that part of the world and grow our manufacturing here. We have two Eds in there. The last names both begin with G, so I can't say Ed, Ed, Ed Gerwin. Well, I think the important thing about the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that it is a modern trade agreement. You know, our politicians seem hell-bent every time you turn on the TV and watch a political debate. Everyone wants to relitigate NAFTA. NAFTA is a 20-year-old agreement, and trade has changed remarkably since then. Uh, primarily because of the power of the internet and because of efficient and modern transportation and logistics. It's a lot easier in many ways to trade. But trade is also changing. And, and I like to talk about the three major changes that are occurring in trade. We're seeing big changes in who can trade. We're seeing big changes in what we trade. And we're seeing big changes in how we trade. So for example, who can trade? It used to be really hard for small businesses to trade. But now with internet platforms like eBay and Etsy and PayPal, it is a lot easier for small businesses to trade. And if you look at what small businesses now do, those that are internet enabled, um, those on the eBay platform, 97% of them trade but only about 5% of our regular small businesses trade. In terms of what we trade, look at the digital apps on your smartphone. Nobody envisioned any of this back at, at the time of NAFTA. The global market for digital apps is only about 10 years old. It drives hundreds of billions of dollars of commerce, and it depends on digital trade flows, something that was, not, was is probably a footnote at the time of NAFTA. And then how we trade, there are whole new ways of trading. Sending, you know, I, I, I've told the story in, in an article I've written about a woman who's designed 3D printable shoes. And her business model is these, she's going to ship them to boutiques all around the world. You go, they scan your foot, and zap, out comes a custom designed pair of shoes. That's an entirely different way of trading than back in NAFTA. And you're probably wondering, is he going to get back around to TPP? The important thing about TPP is it sets modern rules for a changing global economy, for changing global trade. It has, and I've written extensively on this, extensive provisions to help small businesses trade. They can take advantage of these new platforms but then at the same time, we're using the power of the government to do what I'm sure many of you in this room think is important, and that is getting rid of governmental barriers to American trade. Uh, there are extensive provisions for small business. There are also important rules of the road for digital trade. You know, think about it. Uh, Google was registered as a domain name in 1997. That's about the time our global trade rules were last updated. So what that means is we don't have a lot on the books globally um, to govern digital trade. The way we do have rules that make it easier for, 
for um, or open freer trade for goods and services. So what the TPP would do, I think, Ed, you and your colleagues have estimated, what, 24 different digital provisions that the TPP would help? I think that's right. Mm -hmm. um, it would do many things to make digital trade flow more readily, including establishing the very important principle that governments aren't to interfere with the free flow of digital information unless they have a legitimate reason for doing it, like privacy or national security. So I've been really focused on these two aspects of the TPP, on small business and on the digital economy. And the reason I have is because we're ignoring the fact in mu much of our political debate that trade has changed, and we need modern agreements like the TPP that will help the United States take advantage of that. I mean, if there is a country in the world that should be able to benefit from trade that's more friendly to small business and that depends on the digital economy, it should be the United States. Thanks. Ed Gresser? Okay. Um, let me uh, sort of dial a little bit back or pull back a little bit. Um, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, is an agreement that uh, we have negotiated with 11 um, partner countries. They are Canada, Mexico, Peru, Chile, Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and Japan. Together, our, 14 part, our, our 11 partners make up about um, $3 trillion in imports each year. Um, that means every 1% of market share gain is about $30 billion in exports. Um, they include three of our five largest trading partners in the world, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. And second, TPP is a, what you call a comprehensive agreement. Um, it is 30 chapters um, trying to take on pretty much every major issue that Congress has identified to the administration in its bipartisan negotiating objectives uh, set out last year. Um, it's, it takes a while to describe it, but let me hit four things that I think are really high points of this agreement. Um, one, as Linda mentioned, um, you, you may have seen pictures of TPP looking about three feet high. Uh, about um, two feet of that are tax cuts, elimination of tariffs. Um, that includes three inches of U.S. tariff elimination and about 21 inches of foreign tariff elimination. Um, examples range from Vietnam 70% tariff on cars to Japan 600% tariff on out of quota peanuts to uh, Malaysia's 30% tariff on paint. Um, our three inches of tariff elimination, they include things like 11.2% tariff on bamboo shoots and 8.5% tariffs on straw mushrooms. Those are things that are going to help the proprietors of Asian groceries across the river in um, Alexandria. Or likewise, uh, elimination of 48% tariff on cheap shoes that people will buy up the street in Southeast. Um, second thing about TPP that we're quite proud of, um, TPP is the first U.S. trade agreement in 22 years since the Uruguay Round that created the WTO to eliminate a subsidy. This is subsidies that contribute to overfishing and um, depletion of fisheries in the Pacific region. Um, that is a major environmental accomplishment. It is also a very appropriate reform of bringing government out of an area that it shouldn't be operating in. Third, uh, TPP is a very comprehensive agricultural agreement. Um, it includes tariffs, sanitary and phytosanitary rules, fair approaches to geographical indications and, another, and other issues. To just give a sense of the scope of the, the farm trade part of this, Japan eliminates a 40% tariff on American cheese. It creates a 114,000 ton country specific quota for American wheat. It cuts tariffs on beef from 38.5% to 9%. And it agrees that Japan will never accept rules that bar imports of US wine, which use labels such as ruby, tawny, vintage, fine, chateau, and other words that certain parties across the different ocean are trying to uh, <laughs> lock down and take out of uh, the, um, the world of trade. Um, as Ed mentioned, it is the most advanced and ambitious um, digital trade agreement the US has ever done. Uh, requires um, all the TPP members must re require, uh, allow free flows of digital data across borders. That is very important to internet companies. That is very important to manufacturers. If you see, for example, a modern tractor, um, they take data flowing about weather, about seed uh, placement, and they transfer it back and forth all the time to centers in the United States. And that's what makes an American tractor so attractive and so effective. Um, 
TPP countries cannot uh, require servers or other computer capacity to be located in country if you want to serve um, the, the market there. And TPP countries must have anti-spam, privacy, and anti-cyber theft uh, policies. So um, we feel that this is a, a very advanced and very high quality uh, internet and digital agreement. And it's also a kind of strategically important one because each day the future of the internet is kind of being determined. Um, one of the things that Ambassador Froman, our cabinet officer, likes to say is that TPP is an effort to write the rules for the next global economy. In this world of digital trade, which is important to us as computer users, to services companies, to manufacturers, all, all the rest, the United States stands for free flows of information and consumer protection and open, uh, flow, open flows of information around the world. Uh, government of China, government of Russia, government of Egypt, others are trying very hard in the United Nations, World Conference on Information and Telecommunications, International Telecommunications Union, to set up a principle of internet sovereignty, which is to say that the digital border is the same as the physical border, and any government has an absolute right to stop flows of data, to censor it, to redirect it as they choose. And this is a case where one of those visions can determine the future, but they can't coexist very easily. And this is one of the biggest long-term things that we see at stake as Congress is considering TPP. Um, not that I needed much convincing, but each of you have done a great job to reinforce uh, a view that I had that uh, TPP is, as far as trade uh, agreements go, sort of, I, I don't know, like the gold standard maybe of, <laughs> of trade agreements. To coin a phrase. Uh, yeah, I like, yeah. <laughs> I, I copyright it. Um, I, uh, I write a lot on trade, and I, I, when I express public support for TPP, one of the objections that I get, I get it with surprising frequency, maybe you do as well, and perhaps this is a softball question for you, but let me put it to you, because I really, I, I think I know how to handle it, but I wonder how you handle it. People will say, oh, this is, an, this is an affront to American sovereignty. Let's stop TPP because it's, <laughs> it's, it's undermining American sovereignty. How do you respond to that? It's a concern that apparently a lot, at least people that I encounter have. I think it's mistaken, but I wonder your thoughts. Well, I think, first of all, as I mentioned, um, a lot of what the TPP does is reduce foreign governmental barriers to American commerce. It makes um, trade freer for American companies and workers. Uh, many uh, countries want to impose these barriers and make uh, our economic uh, activities more restricted. Uh, TPP, as Ed, I, I, I want to get those numbers from you, Ed, by the way, of inches of <laughs> okay. TPP. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful word picture. But much of what TPP does is reduce governmental barriers imposed by, by foreign countries. And in terms of the way the process works, I'm not a congressional person, but my understanding is that there is nothing in any of these trade agreements that requires the United States to do anything. At the end of the day, it's Congress that would have to react to actions that, you know, for example, violations of the TPP. Uh, Congress has the last word, and that is very important. But I think the key point is that we're actually creating greater freedom for people by eliminating many of the barriers that currently exist in the trade system. For example, as Ed mentioned, the efforts of countries to limit the ability of people to trade digitally by trying to you know, require that our companies put servers in their country or saying that we can only store data in their locations. I would add two, two points on this. It is a sovereign act of a government to negotiate and conclude a trade agreement. That's a choice. If we want to isolate ourselves, we, we heard how Doug described Smoot-Hawley, you know, unemployment went up, exports went down, imports went down. Uh, not the type of result. And it was found following that with Cordell Hull um, and, and beyond that unemployment only went up again after the Smoot-Hawley tariffs when the United States started its reciprocal trade agreements program and started negotiating as a sovereign with other sovereign countries so that everybody would be reducing their tariffs. And that's the trading system that began uh, in, that, in that period and has continued forward. 
So it is a sovereign act of a government to choose to enter into a trade agreement and make these. But I think the more important point, and building on something um, both Eds have said, this is building on U.S. values, U.S. rules, U.S. systems. Uh, so much of what is in the TPP is reflective uh, of the rules we already have in the United States. So the United States, uh, if we hopefully get to implement it this year, is not going to be making a lot of legal changes. We're not changing things that we've done wrong. Uh, we've got a few tweaks here and, and a few statutes to make. But this is basically exporting basic values, things like the takings clause of our U.S. Constitution uh, that requires the government to compensate a private property owner if they take their property, due process principles, equal protection principles, fair and equitable treatment type principles that we see also in our Administrative Procedure Act. These are baseline principles that we in the United States have developed as part of our democracy, as part of our capitalist system, that we are trying to get the other parts of the world to adopt. And so this is very much, very much uh, an act of our sovereignty. Yeah, I don't really have very much to add. These are very you know, well, uh, well presented points. The, the, the only additional thing, Linda and I became acquainted as congressional staffers um, not so long ago. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, and constitutionally, all of this is foreseen and set out. Um, Constitution tells Congress to regulate uh, commerce with foreign nations, it tells presidents to negotiate agreements with foreign countries, and that is exactly how TPP has been done. Congress has looked at our relationships, they have set negotiating objectives for us, we have done our very best to meet those objectives, and Congress now has the chance to act on them. So, uh, no, I do not see that there's any diminution of sovereignty in that. We're exact, you know, this is exactly the way U.S. government has been told to act by the framers. Yeah, it, seem, it, it, it seems to me that anyone who objects to TPP on the grounds that it uh, somehow uh, uh, is an unwarranted reduction in U.S. sovereignty it, it must object to all treaties in principle. I mean, and, and, but the Constitution clearly provides for the treaty-making power. Yes, we had our very first trade yeah. agreement, I believe it was 1794, uh, yeah. Jay Treaty. We've been sacrificing our sovereignty for quite some time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, to build on Linda's point, it's really amazing when you look at it, the degree to which other countries are being asked to change their rules. Uh, we went uh, last September to Vietnam and we met with government people, manufacturers, and people from the International Labor Organization. Vietnam is agreeing to set up independent unions. Now, you gotta remember, this is a socialist workers paradise. They're not supposed to need anybody other than the government to look out for the welfare of workers. But they've agreed to do that in part because they want this agreement, but also in part that they recognize the fact that, you know, there are already a lot of wildcat strikes now in Vietnam, and they recognize that maybe having independent representation for their workers would be a good thing for them as well. But these are huge changes that other countries are making that redound in many instances to the benefits of American exporters and American workers who produce for exporters. This is a question from someone in the audience. Uh, how do you see TPP two years from now under either a Clinton or a Trump presidency? Wow. <laughs> well, uh, can I take a first step? Absolutely. As, uh, one of the laws that we in the government operate under is the Hatch Act. And we are not permitted to say anything about um, presidential candidates or their proposals. But let me talk about TPP as it is likely to play out as you know, analysts have uh, you know, looked at it and, and modeled it, and as people who are kind of engaged in some of the issues it raise, um, you know, make the case for it and point out what might happen in its absence. Uh, there have been a number of um, professional, you know, independent modelings done on the TPP. Uh, these show um, different things depending on what your assumptions are and how much of the agreement you model, but they agree, um, both the International Trade Commission and the Peterson Institute, that TPP will raise the rate of economic growth in the United States to some extent, that it will raise wages in the United States. And in the ITC's model, they find the first year, uh, which would be 2017, uh, if it were implemented um, coming this year, 
There's a jump in GDP of about $20 billion. About two-thirds of that goes to workers in the form of higher wages and uh, some degree of new jobs. Peterson Institute um, has different figures, but comes out with the same figure of, of growth beginning quickly and two-thirds of the benefits going to workers. Look a little bit more detailed. Um, one of the groups that's really interested in TPP and working very hard on its ratification is the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Uh, I've mentioned big cut in Japanese beef tariffs. Uh, what they say is that, um, I've had this written down somewhere, um, NCBA says, our future success rests on our ability to compete on a level playing field in the Pacific Rim, and TPP presents us with that golden opportunity. So that's, uh, they say, if we have TPP going to effect, we'll be selling more beef to Japan, rancher incomes will rise, all those sorts of things. Without the TPP, we have some erosion. Um, we are not the only country that's doing trade agreements. And Australia, Japan, FTA went into effect a um, year ago, January. Uh, the NCBA believes that has already cost them, by virtue of uh, tariff differentials, uh, about $140 million in exports. And in the absence of TPP, that will continue and it will be replicated across many, many industries because um, at the moment, as we're debating TPP, there's also negotiation of a much lo uh, very large China-centered regional co closer economic partnership agreement, which would create a large duty-free zone excluding the United States for China and Korea and Japan and Australia and New Zealand and um, 10 Southeast Asian countries plus India. So that, that's a big thing and the, the future will evolve in, in the absence of TPP and one in a way that isn't all that great for us economically. Second point, a uh, person I'd like to quote, um, this is our Pacific Fleet Commander, Admiral Harris, um, who's looking at the implications of TPP for security and strategy. And what he says is, TPP would strengthen stability and security, deepening our re relationships throughout the region, and raising the bar to protect the things that matter. Things like enhanced cybersecurity, privacy, and provisions to combat the theft of trade secrets, including by cyber theft, to protect our defense industrial base. And obviously, our partners who've signed up for TPP, this is our allies, Japan, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so forth, see it as a vital demonstration of America's enduring commitment to the region. So in the absence of TPP, if it does not go into effect, there will be um, a significant economic penalty in a number of areas, and there will be a large and impossible to quantify, but probably somewhat serious um, blow to the U.S. position in the Asia Pacific, which is uh, a big thing. Uh, the, this is a serious choice and one that has implications in a lot of areas. Maybe I could build on um, Ed's first point, but look at it from the manufacturing sector. U.S. Uh, manufacturing is alive and well. Doug sort of talked about that a bit. We manufacture more today in the United States than we ever have before, but for um, many of the reasons that Doug talked about, we do so with fewer workers. But we are at a status quo disadvantage in the global economy, and you have on, on the, the slides. We face, in the United States as exporters, higher tariffs than 129 other countries, including China, including Chile, including Mexico, and every member state of the European Union. And all of those countries, the reason why they face lower tariffs in their exports is because they've negotiated a heck of a lot more trade agreements than the United States has. We have 14 trade agreements with 20 countries. Those 20 countries are outsized purchasers of our products, purchasing nearly 50% of US manufactured exports, even though they represent 6% of the world's population, 10% of the global economy. We do better when markets are open, when distortions are eliminated, and we're in a global economy where we're not just competing against ourselves, in these foreign markets, we're competing against all these other countries. From our perspective, we've got to open up these economies. And one easy example, and this is in, in the slides as well, is we are losing market share right now, and we have been over a decade uh, coming to China in those four TPP economies where we don't have trade agreements, but they do. So that's Brunei, New Zealand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. We used to be about 30% of the import share to those markets. We're down to about 10%. And China has completely taken it and taken it above our share. We are losing under the status quo. So we've got to figure out how to get this done uh, or we are going to continue to lose. And so we are working very hard 
trying to um, get the administration to solve some of the outstanding issues so that we have a political ability to move this agreement during the lame duck. Uh, working with Congress as well because you need both sides to work on this, but that's got to get done so that we can get this agreement implemented. Well, Don, I think it's a truism that political candidates are usually a lot more, a lot less favorable toward trade than presidents happen to be. Uh, it's amazing when a candidate gets into office how they have a change in perspective when it comes to trade. Take, for example, President Obama. You know, he campaigned uh, in many ways against NAFTA in 2008. He got into office. It took his team a while to kind of get up and running, but eventually they realized the wisdom of three trade agreements that the United States had negotiated uh, with Korea, Colombia, and Panama and pushed very hard for those agreements to get enacted. Then they've taken the reins as well on uh, TPP and other initiatives that the Bush administration started. I think the same would happen with a new president. Uh, if TPP were enacted during the lame duck session, I think a new president, whoever that is, would start to realize how important those agreements are to the United States economy. I think one of the things they would realize is the day they're in office, there are going to be a whole bunch of other countries knocking on the door saying, you know that TPP? We want in too. I mean, there are a number of other countries that are sitting on the sidelines who want to join the TPP and be part of this greater Asia Pacific uh, free trade area. And smart presidents would realize that's some geopolitical leverage that they could use to their advantage. So I think that's something that extre that's extremely important. Um, and, you know, again, they would also recognize the benefits of these agreements. Uh, Mr. Trump was quoted as saying at a rally, I think it was in Kansas, that the day after he's elected president, he's going to get rid of high duties on American beef to Japan. Well, if the TPP is enacted before he's into office, that, product, that process will already begin. And I think he, he and other and, and, and Secretary Clinton as well would recognize that ultimately this is in the strong benefit of, uh, of the United States. It's not easy. It will be messy like all our politics are. But I think eventually people uh, come around to recognizing the benefits of these trade agreements. Before I ask another question that the audience uh, offers, I, I understand that and know historically that that's been the trend that particularly presidents, they do become more trade friendly when they're in the Oval Office than they were on the campaign trail. But do you not worry that there's something that's evident in this campaign season that maybe make, that will maybe change things? Um, I, I, I'm usually optimistic, but the, the hostility against trade that is out there today, the, the fact that one of the candidates was once a strong proponent of TPP and is now expressly skeptical of it. The other candidate is downright hostile to it, despite the fact that that other candidate obviously doesn't know all the details of it. Uh, is it, is it uh, misplaced to worry that maybe something is amiss now that uh, uh, wasn't in the past? I think you're absolutely right, Don. You're absolutely right. And I think this underscores the importance of programs like this one and the the project at the Mercatus Center, people generally don't understand these issues. Um, you know, the interesting thing is we've done some polling at the Progressive Policy Institute among Democratic-leaning voters, and you know, if you if you saw the Philadelphia Convention, you'd think every Democrat is opposed to trade. There were all the anti-TPP signs up, but if you look at the actual polling, for example, we polled Democrats in swing states. 66% of Democrats think high standard trade agreements are a good thing. Only 25% think they're bad. Um, but the problem is those opinions are kind of weakly held. The people whose jobs are impacted, as Doug mentioned, they have a very strong incentive uh, to, to be loud and vocal and against these. And you know, speaking from the Democratic side, uh, our friends in the labor union movement, I think, use trade as, in many ways, more an organizing principle than a, than a philosophical uh, argument. 
So there's a ton of work that we have to do. But I think the ground is, is favorable if we can do more things like this to educate both the, you know, the population generally and more of our elected officials. Uh, but I'm not for any minute discounting how difficult it would be. You know, I, I think what we're seeing is a broader economic uncertainty and concern. Some of it is clearly related to the slower growth. We, we have growth. We've grown manufacturing jobs, for instance. We, you know, we've seen slow economic growth in this country and, and globally, but people are not feeling the benefits of that. They're seeing other costs go up, health care, um, wages in, in certain parts uh, of the economy are not as high as people want. They haven't returned to the, to, um, the level they were right before uh, the last recession. And that's causing an uncertainty and people are looking to blame somebody. And when politicians are out there blaming trade or other things as the problem, uh, we are unfortunately missing a chance to really address those issues. I think there's a broader issue here, though, and it, it is the change. And, and, and my colleagues here have talked a lot about how much TPP does on e-commerce and the information technology. Uh, when I was a Hill staffer on the Senate Finance Committee decades ago, sorry, Ed, it was a long time ago, <laughs> the Internet had just begun. Think about your lives today if you didn't have a smartphone. I mean, gee, phones, we had cell phones back then. They weren't allowed on the Senate floor for heaven's sake. Um, but, uh, you know, the world was completely different. The manufacturing shop floor is completely different. I have our companies coming in, and by the way, NAM represents 90, 90 some percent of our manufacturers are small manufacturers, which is reflective of, of the broader economy. But we have some of our, our manufacturers come in, say capital equipment, and, and we talk to their plant managers before they come see um, members of Congress. And it's like, you know, I know we produce a lot, I know we're exporting, but I look around and I, I see factories that are closed that are not opening, or there's communities in my state that, that haven't gone. What's that about? And it's so easy to blame trade, especially when you have loud politicians, other interest groups out there saying, this is the reason. We are in a cycle of major change like the Industrial Revolution was and the movement from agriculture to, to industry. And it's changing our communities. It's changing our factories. It's changing the way we work and the way we live. And we need policymakers and leaders and in industry and non-governmental organizations to recognize and speak about that and not try to go blame somebody else because that's not going to solve those problems. That's not going to get our economy growing again. These other countries, if they're not moving forward with the TPP and they keep their, their uh, markets shut, they're not going to grow either. We all need to grow together and we can do that in a pro-competitive type of way. We need other policies and, and Doug talked about some of the, the things he's thinking about. Our organization certainly has lots of ideas about how to grow the competitiveness of the, the manufacturing sector in the, in the United States. But we need to be talking about what's really out there and not just finding that easy scapegoat. I don't have that much to add, maybe one little anecdote. Um, we should be, I think, kind of optimistic about the American industrial economy. Uh, we have added factory jobs for the last six years in a row. That's the first time that's happened since the 1960s. We are near an all-time uh, uh, production record. I was in uh, Los Angeles last week and talking to uh, a garment manufacturer, a woman with an interesting name, she's named Chewy. She makes uh, high-end uh, baby and girls clothes, which she exports to Japan. So I asked her, you know, how, did you, you know, how do you feel? What do you think about that? And, and um, she said, well, you know, if someone wants to import baby clothes duty-free, they can do it. They can do it from Mexico. They can do it from Central America. What I try to do is to uh, emphasize branding, um, to say this is an L.A. product, this is sexy, this is cool, this, is, uh, this has assets that you're not going to get on the mass market. I'm worried about counterfeiting and loss of control of my brand. I'm worried about the, the cost of shipping. Um, tell me what TPP does in these things. So, there are a lot of very successful, very creative, small, light manufacturing in, uh, businesses in the country. California also the first, I think the first place in the world to launch a new major, major automobile manufacturer in 50 years. So we, should, uh, you know, we shouldn't buy into an idea that 
things are really bad and things are going downhill. We certainly have a lot of challenges. We think TPP will help with some of them, um, won't help with all of them, but it is one piece, I think, and, and this is the, the case the president has made and, and others have made for, about you know, why it's so important to, to, get, to get this done. So here's another question from, from the audience. Uh, if, let's hope this if does not come to pass, but if TPP is, fails, Congress refuses to approve TPP, uh, do you see the ability uh, of the next administration whatever that might be, uh, to uh, at least minimize the failures by negotiating individual trade agreements with different countries? That's a lot of work. I mean, the TPP has taken an immense amount of work from negotiating teams of two, two administrations. Um, going back, I think, you know, the British experience in Brexit it may be a little bit instructive on this. You know, they have to reassemble a whole trade negotiation team because they've decided to pull out of the EU. We don't have to do that, but we would basically, with many countries, have to go back to ground zero and start negotiating again. And of course, if you're doing it with individual countries, the dynamics are completely different. You know, the dynamics of a 12 country agreement are very different from an individual country agreement. But the question I have for that is, that's, that strikes me as a very inefficient way to do trade policy. There are lots of countries in the world. It could take us a long time to do that. And no one has really underscored for me why it is a, a preferable um, course of action. You know, it seems to me, for example, if we can get 12 countries to agree on common rules of origin for products, that's a lot more efficient than the current spaghetti bowl or noodle bowl that we have now where you have all of these different trade agreements with different rules of origin and different requirements and different standards. Uh, Linda can speak much better to this than I can, but I know when I was in private practice, um, as a trade lawyer, if a company came to me and said there are 12 different kinds of rules you have to comply with to get these benefits, I'd probably tell them just forget it, just trade the way you do now. Because, of one, because a bunch of one-off trade agreements without some coordination really doesn't get people there. It certainly doesn't help the United States maximize its influence, and particularly on things like the digital economy. If we want to write the rules for global digital trade that reflect American values, that reflect openness, rather than have them being written by the Chinese and the Russians, we should maximize our influence. And these larger agreements are a way to do that. And building on Ed's point um, about the spaghetti bowl, boy, in, in my perfect world, we, we would be at the WTO. We'd be doing all of these rules globally um, because it's a heck of a lot of red, red tape. Uh, we all know the problems with red tape. Uh, but for these small companies, it really hurts them most of all. But I want to take it back to another piece of this, which is going back to NAFTA. And, and I will be one of those people for every day of my life to defend NAFTA as having helped grow and make U.S. manufacturing stronger. We are stronger today. We, we produce, um, we've more, about doubled U.S. manufacturing output in this country since 1993, and NAFTA is a big part of that. If we were to negotiate, so Canada and Mexico joining the TPP negotiations with something um, NAM and others in the manufacturing sector generally applauded. This was seen, we have supply chains uh, with these three countries and this industrial base that makes us stronger. It makes our steel industry stronger as they testified to the International Trade Commission. It makes our automotive industry stronger here. We do better and we do better globally because of NAFTA. If we're gonna be negotiating ourselves with Vietnam without NAFTA, Boy, that's going to have a negative impact on just the production model that we have here in the United States. And that's just NAFTA. We have global supply chains. You heard Doug talk about how much of global trade is intermediate trade. That helps us be stronger. Where that product is finally uh, assembled may not matter. So much of that technology, that research and development, that capital investment is actually done here in the United States. 
you know, our, our latest statistic is 80% of U.S. manufacturing firms are looking for skilled workers because we don't have enough skilled workers in this country. Uh, starting again, boy, I, I, I don't see where um, it's going to take time and it's just not going to give the benefits that moving forward on TPP is really going to give to our economy. Um, I guess without giving a uh, personal opinion, um, U.S. has a uh, U.S. has a lot of friends. Um, some of them are very uh, polite and cautious when they speak about us, and others are blunt and say exactly what they think. You don't want to have every friend be like that, but you want a few. Um, the uh, Prime Minister of Singapore, I uh, was here a few weeks ago, um, said um, was asked exactly this question. He said, "Well, you know, we as Singaporeans, we've been asked a lot in the TPP. We've been asked to discipline state-owned enterprises. We've been asked to open services markets. We've been asked to do labor and environmental standards. If um, U.S." doesn't do this and say, okay, we're, we're not going to do it, you're not going to have a lot of credibility as soon as you go back to the beginning and start over again. So let me ask a, a, a quick follow-up question. This is going to be the last before uh, we close out. Again, it's a pessimistic question. If TPP fails, um, uh, what then would you recommend the next steps be? What, what, would, what private uh, recommendations would you give to whoever is the most pro-free trade supporter in the next administration for how to capture some of the benefits that are lost by this conjectured failure of TPP? Well, you know, trade negotiations, uh, as Professor Irwin can certainly attest to, you know, have their ups and downs. And, you know, oftentimes you have something that has failed, uh, but then has been revived. I mean, I would urge uh, anyone to do everything they possibly can to maintain TPP, you know, to recognize that if it kind of fails at one point, uh, we ought to do everything we can to try to revive it uh, uh, as a model. I think, you know, this alternative of doing a bunch of one-off trade agreements um, really doesn't make any sense to me at all. It, 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 it is not useful at all. And I think one of the things that I think is overlooked in this is the geopolitical benefits of having, you know, Asia Pacific wide trade agreements. You know, we've heard a lot about this from diplomats at the TPP countries. Uh, and they're relatively forceful when they say it's extremely important for them to have these agreements with the United States. But at the same time, they're also diplomats. So they have to be diplomatic. I've had some kind of off the record discussions with people at the various embassies and they say basically this. They say, you know, if we don't do the TPP with you, we're very concerned that China is gonna have a heck of a lot more leverage over us because so many of these countries trade heavily with China. And what they fear is a situation in which they have great trade with China and someday the Chinese call up their prime minister and say, uh, you know that maritime dispute we have? We want you on board on our side on this. And if you don't, um, you know, all your shipments of widgets or meat or milk or whatever it is are suddenly going to have difficulties at the border. This is not an unknown thing for the Chinese to do. And I think it really underscores why it's very important for us to have these broader regional agreements. I agree with Linda, it would be nice if we could do global trade agreements at the WTO. Uh, but failing that, I think it's very important to have these broader regional agreements because that helps us maximize America's geopolitical influence. That helps us spread values that are important to us as Americans. I will be very upset. <laughs> I think many in this room, and, and certainly I know um, many manufacturers will be. I, look, we're going to have to start at ground zero. I mean, part of it is focusing on the real issues that are slowing the U.S. economy, that are slowing the job growth, the income growth that we all want to see in this country. And some of those are domestic issues, be they tax. Uh, let's all talk about infrastructure and modernizing U.S. infrastructure so we can compete um, better globally. Uh, there's energy policy, regulatory policy, et cetera, that, that we need to tackle as a country. Uh, and, and I certainly hope that we can do so. 
But we've also got to recognize that global trade is about 14 trillion. Yes, it's slowed considerably. It's not growing as fast as it was. It is still so much more uh, than what we're selling here in the United States. And the more we are cut off, the worse we are going to be, the less innovative we are going to be, and the less strong we are going to be across all the sectors of our economy. We're just going to have to double down and, and go back about how can we grow uh, and how can we stay engaged globally? Because we know what happens. We saw what happened, smooth Hawley, when we weren't engaged globally. We've got to figure out how to get back again. Yeah. Uh, I would just say um, there's no reason to accept the premise. Uh, Congress has every, <laughs> uh, every right and, every, and some responsibility to take a look at the agreement and uh, you have ample time to pass it this year. This is one case where I don't mind not having my premise accepted. <laughs> oh, not accepted, <laughs> rejected, yeah. With that, let me turn it over to my uh, colleague, Dan. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for that very, very distinguished panel. You know, we've, and thank you all for coming out today at this very uh, critical time for U.S. trade policy. You know, you've probably gathered there's a general pro-trade perspective to this, uh, but we actually had some very distinct uh, institutional angles illuminating uh, different facets of, of trade. From Professor Irwin, we get a really a, a centuries broad scope of U.S. trade policy and seeing today's trade debate uh, in the context of U.S. policy. We've heard from the administration that uh, did a lot to ne actually negotiate uh, this agreement from a hugely important sector, not the only sector in the U.S. economy, but a hugely important one, manufacturing. And then uh, we hear about the cutting edge aspects of this, having to do with small and medium sized enterprises being more involved in trade uh, and, and data. And if I were to sum up uh, kind of the theme of all these uh, together, you know, we hear a lot in this election cycle about the winners and losers of trade, and that's fine. We should talk about, about that. We seem to pay a lot of attention uh, to the losers, and I don't think we should ignore that. But I think a huge message from this today is that there are a lot of winners from trade, and they hugely outnumber the losers. Uh, both in number and in economic uh, weight. There's things we can do to help people make the adjustments who lose out from trade. So to sum it up, trade is not a zero-sum uh, game. Trade is a win-win for America. We win as exporters. 80% of the world's spending power, 95% of the world's people are outside the United States. We must sell in those markets for U.S. industry and service providers uh, to thrive in the 21st century. But we win as importers, as consumers, uh, not just the middle class, but low-income consumers. And we win as producers who are importing those goods, as Professor Irwin reminded us. Our manufacturers cannot be competitive in global markets unless they can access global supply chains and buy global supplies and inputs uh, at competitive uh, global market prices. And of course, we win as investors abroad, being able to invest in productive facilities abroad. You know, U.S. companies sell much more to foreign consumers through their foreign-owned affiliates than they do exporting from the United States. That's the way we reach customers with U.S. branded products. If we start badgering and taxing U.S. companies that invest abroad, uh, we're going to lose market share to those who can move into those uh, markets. And of course, we benefit when we win when foreign companies can invest in the United States. There are six million of our fellow Americans who work in the United States for foreign-owned affiliates. Almost a third of them are in manufacturing. I think it's close to two million U.S. manufacturing workers are working for foreign-owned companies uh, in the United States. If we start interfering in the flow of dollars, there's going to be fewer dollars coming back uh, to invest in those uh, facilities. And of course, it's a win-win with other nations. Uh, we win here in the United States. Other nations win. You know, trade wouldn't happen if the two parties weren't better off. A particular trade doesn't happen unless the two parties are better off. And you multiply that by millions, and you get the broad win-win uh, uh, benefits of trade. Uh, we deepen our supply chains and our global integration. Um, we've talked about foreign policy wins uh, in terms of knitting nations together, uh, being able to be more 
cooperative. You know, one of the one of the manifestations of globalization over the last 30 years uh, has been the lifting of hundreds of millions of people out of poverty around the world. This is something we should care about as human beings, but there's a geostrategic component to that too. People who are lifted up from grinding poverty can pay more attention to things like the environment, uh, getting more representation in their country. We have a growing middle class uh, around the world, and that is very much in America's uh, interest. And uh, we encourage peace among nations. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Irwin mentioned the trauma of Smoot-Hawley, but there were some other bad things that happened around that time too. The, the economic um, misery and tensions of the 1930s contributed to global uh, tensions on the international stage in terms of uh, uh, war and international relations. So our pro-trade initiative after World War II was based on sound economics, but it was also foreign policy. Secretary of State Cordell Hull understood this very well and wrote about it uh, very, very passionately, that that was part of keeping the peace. And you have to say, in terms of the Western powers that fought two devastating world wars, that has been a successful uh, uh, policy. So to sum up, and again, thank you all for coming out today, uh, our post-war 70-year bipartisan policy of the United States embracing uh, trade liberalization, engaging and leading on the global stage uh, in trade <clears throat> has been a winning policy uh, for, for the American people, uh, including, uh, and I think you, you've gathered the Trans-Pacific Partnership is very much in that uh, bipartisan uh, tradition. Uh, it would be foolish, uh, really beyond belief, uh, to turn uh, away from that very successful policy. So I want to thank all of you for coming out today, our, all of our speakers, and thank you again.